Friends. I'm Dave Moskin, the current chair of the Friends of Lake Warner and the Mill River here in Hadley. Thank you very much. So we're here today to celebrate the transfer of the lake, the dam, uh, the peninsula, almost six acres of land, and an endowment all from the Kestrel Land Trust um, that came to the Friends of Lake Warner. I'd like to introduce first Jason Johnson, our executive director. Jason's been with us pretty much since the beginning. Uh, looking after um, water quality issues, data collection, uh, relationships with UMass, the state, federal authorities. Um, Jason, if you would just say a word, please, about why we're here today and why this matters. Um, thanks very much, everybody, for coming. This was a really wonderful cooperative um, project between the community and Kestrel and really Terry Blunt in, in invented what we were going to do in a meeting over 10 years ago. Um, and he really loved this place and wanted to see it preserved. And so this was a manifestation of a lot of years of work in doing that. Um, really thank everybody from the town, Representative Sybeck, and or really the community coming forward and making sure that this happened. Because I don't think it would have happened without the uh, stalwart support of the community and financial support. Okay, thank you, Jason. I probably should have asked Kristen to speak first, but uh, Kristen DeBoer, the executive director of the Kester Land Trust, who really made all this happen pretty much single-handedly. Her board was not always firmly behind her with the, um, saving the lake and everything. So Kristen's the, uh, the heroine for the project. Kristen, say hello. All right. What's in the bag? Oh, okay, let's do the bag. So let's do the bag. Knowing David, it's alcoholic. <laughs> Jason, join me, please. The bag first. Anybody from the Friends of Lake Warner that would like to come up? Board members? This is the key okay. to the gate. I know. Oh, I know what okay. it is. So if you would like but to... Everyone else has to guess. What do you think's in the bag? <laughs> Anybody? Anybody? Not <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> sure. So maybe All right. you, can, you can present that. I, I'll, I'll say a little bit what this is. So um, I also want to thank everyone here. Jason's right, it would not have happened without your support, without the state's support, without the town, uh, the Community Preservation Act coming behind this. Senator Rosenberg also supported this project with Sen uh, Representative Seibach. So having the full state and town uh, behind the repair of this historic dam made a huge difference, as did the individual donations of everyone who lives in this neighborhood. We even had a donor who grew up here but lives in California now who made a major gift. So all those donations came together to really give the energy to make this happen. So I also want to thank um, Morris Root, our engineer, and the two uh, contractors who, who were patiently working with the neighbors on both sides to ensure that their lives could go on during this process. So. Um, when it was going on, I have to admit, I didn't come here very often because it was kind of like open heart surgery. <laughs> I had no idea what was going on. It looked messy. I was powerless to help. So I just checked in by phone periodically. And then at the end, I got to walk out on the dam and the engineer handed me this, this metal thing that's in this bag, which you can open now. <laughs> Guessing is over. And I really didn't know what to make of this metal thing because I, I, I have no background in dams. I, I now learned a lot about spillways and all sorts of things. But um, this, what's in here, indicates that it's a functioning dam because <laughs> yay, it's a key. And it, it should not be kept there because you just stick it in and you can actually open the gate and the lake would drain. So nobody gets to do that except for the Friends of Lake Warner with a permit. Um, so it's been, it was an exciting project. I, it took a while, but with patience and uh, perseverance, it happened. Um, I do want to thank my board of directors, uh, Kestrel's board, uh, for using also on reserve, uh, unrestricted reserve funds from Kestrel's um, balance sheet because we wanted to match what the community had brought forward and we needed to take responsibility for this. Um, you know, our mission is bigger uh, in the valley to 
protect forests and farms and special places. So we wanted to give it to uh, the Friends Group because we knew you would have the focus on this special place while we're looking at the big picture. So that's why it's made a difference. So thank you for thank taking you, it Kristen. on. Thank you, David. Thank you, all of you. Tom Harris. Ginger. So two of our elected officials had an instrumental role in raising the enormous amount of money that was needed to restore the dam. Uh, one of them is here with us today. One of them could not make it. Stan Rosenberg had to be out in Colorado, he said, but he had planned to be here. But we do have State Representative John Seibach with us. He has a long, illustrious career, being on the right side 99.9% .9 of the time, I'd say, of the issue. <laughs> and, uh, you know, went, went to the hill and fought for this project. A lot of towns fighting for their own projects. Somehow they raised multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars to save this, um, this dam here and one of the oldest mill ponds in America. John, would you just say hello? So although, although I live in South Hadley, my wife and I have kayaked uh, on this lake a number of times and to hear the possibility of this disappearing. And I remember the, the meeting at, at Hopkins Academy where all the, these focus groups, when we look at the possibilities, and we watched a video, I think, from Wisconsin. Yeah. And the Wisconsin video showed how potentially, you know, something's going to happen if the dam goes away. And the one that was most uh, significant for me was showing this body of water becoming a creek that might have been 10 or 20 feet wide, maybe a foot or 18 inches deep. I could just envision myself and my wife in the kayak not moving and saying, you know, this didn't make any sense. Uh, and so I really have to applaud Kestrel for going above and beyond. Uh, but it's kind of interesting in terms of the funding. One of the reasons that we were able to get state funding for this was because of the, the blend and the mix. So it was Kestrel, it was CPA, it was the private donors, the people who are the butters who all lived here. But there were a couple of challenges. I mean, the year that we got the funding, I was told that there was absolutely no funding going into the budget that year for dams. That there were too many structurally uh, hazardous dams and we were not going to fund any dams. And I already promised Kristen we wouldn't get money for this. So how did we do it? And the way we did it was we didn't ask for money for a dam, but we asked for I think it was $125,000 for the restoration of a historic structure in the town of Hadley. <laughs> and no one asked what the historic structure was and we didn't want to know. So we got the money, and then the governor nine seated. And so then we tried to get the money a second time, and the governor vetoed it. And we overrode the money a second time, then it was a third time. And then the third time, I knew we were gonna get the money back, so I didn't even tell Christian that we lost the money a third time. <laughs> but you know, it was the persistence, and, and without the support of this community, everybody here and everyone else, this never would've happened. But it's a clear demonstration of, of a true public-private partnership and a community stepping forward for something that was important. And now generations, well after we're gone, will be able to appreciate this and not be looking at a creek that may be eight or 10 feet wide. So I applaud all of you for your roles. Um, this has really been an easy one. Uh, and for all of us, it's great to see here that it's still operating and still functioning. You know, And so as, as I think it was the National Lampoon Vacation once said, you know, you know this is your damn money. <laughs> this is your damn damn, uh, and it's a fortunate thing for all of us that, that it existed. So thank you. I'm glad to have played a small part in it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah.
and I can, I can look at the uh, bald eagles and osprey and uh, uh, beautiful swamp honeysuckle blooming, making amazing fragrances, and the, the water lilies, and it's just such a gorgeous place to live. So that's why I'm, I'm grateful for them. So I think it's a great day that we've come here to celebrate the takeover of the North Hadley Warner Pond by the citizens, the Friends Group of Lake Warner. And it's part of a long and proud tradition in Hadley of people coming together to accomplish a greater good. Um, I know that back in 1999 and 2000, the whole community came together to save a mountain that was threatened in the south end of town. And I think this is kind of a continuation of that spirit, and I think it's great. I am Andy Morris Friedman. I'm a former board member uh, and a current friend of Lake Warner. Uh, I think North Hadley Pond is the most beautiful place in town. Um, Mount Holyoke's also nice, uh, and the Connecticut River, but it's not a competition. I, I can't work under these conditions. Okay, so I'm Dina Friedman. I live in Hockenville, and I first learned about Lake Warner took me kayaking. He actually taught me how to kayak and canoe on Lake Warner. And it was really an extremely special place. And I went to the first meeting where they talked about the possibility of the whole dam disappearing, which would have been very sad. And they thought it was pretty hopeless. So I'm really excited that this project came to fruition. I sat through many town meetings also where we discussed it. It was interesting discussion and it was really great to see the community come together. Um, well, we've been living in this neighborhood for 24 years now and I've spent quite a, little, a lot of time on the pond. My kids learned to fish there, we've been boating there all these years. and. Um, it's, a, it's a precious resource, um, not just for ourselves, but for wildlife around us and everything else. And it, I've been aware over time that, um, the, uh, you know, that the lake is under pressure from a lot of different um, you know, runoff and all that. And uh, I'd like to see it preserved. I'd like to see it improved. Um, it was it was a different place years ago, and uh, in years from now it will be a different place. The question is, what kind of place will it be? We want it to be a better place. Okay, thanks everybody for showing up. Um, I don't need to take Terry away from the delicious food, but um, just put together a quick presentation to tell you a little bit about what we're doing. historical uses of the pond. The pond really was here and existed before any of the housing was put up around. And so we've been living in an industrialized sort of um, environment for the past 350 years. So the corn mill was, of course, one of the first uh, uses of the pond for hydropower. And then came the broom tool factory and um, the broom industry, which dominated parts of Hadley for 100 years. So this is a shot from the middle of the pond. It's just really interesting to see how things have changed over time. So the entire um, southern and eastern exposure of the, of the pond would have been farm for agriculture with grazing. And um, of course, there would have been a lot of runoff and a lot of exposure to the, to the elements because of the flat of forest. The problems that we've had in the pond did not originate and didn't happen overnight. You know, we've been at this for a long time and it's going to take a long time for it to get better. This is a shot of the corn mill on the 
left-hand side and the broom tool factory on the right-hand side before the 1925 fire, which finally we did in the corn mill. So one of the aspects that we look at um, on the pond is transparency. And this is how much light is transmitted into the pond and causing photosynthesis and depth. So we, uh, generally, if you have less than two meters of transparency, your pond is considered eutrophic. A pond is considered eutrophic, which means it's filled with nutrients and sediment. Um, so this year, actually last year, was the, was the shallowest that we had in the transparency measurements of 1.38 meters. And this is something that we monitor every two weeks or so. Um, another element of what we look at is dissolved oxygen. We look at dissolved oxygen because of the importance of, to terrestrial animals and to aquatic animals. Um, in May, June, and early spring, each year, we have dissolved oxygen levels that are far above the minimum five part per million that are required to sustain life. Uh, as so we get later into July and August, even we see it dropping off in the deepest parts of the lake, which means that portions of the lake are really effectively dead during this part of the year. Um, so creatures are having to find habitat in shallower regions and um, find refuge out of these areas. Um, we're luckily finding that it's bouncing back in the fall before we haven't had fish kill yet, and we haven't had any other extreme sort of event that a dissolved oxygen crash would cause. These are our phosphorus levels for the lake. And phosphorus is really what's driving the plant growth and algae blooms within the pond. Um, so in the upper lake in the river, you can see it's really high here. The middle lake where we sample is right off of the church here, which gives us an idea of basically where the general um, aspect of the pond is. There was a model that was done to predict phosphorus loading depending on the land use area, and they added 120 parts per billion. And the goal for this is to try and get it down to around 40. So we can see <coughs> in between 2016 and 2017, we're sort of starting to seem like we're getting to that level in, in the mid part of the lake. But as you can see, it's above the eutrophic, eutrophic level. So we're going to have that amount is still going to cause a lot of, of buildup in the lake. So we're going to have to have some other strategies for removing phosphorus. Um, and usually that comes from either sediment inactivation, where we put something like alum to bind the sediment into the, into the soil, or you have a dredging project. Now, a dredging project is going to make our dam repair costs just look minuscule. <coughs> This is something that we can't afford really as a small organization, and so we're strategizing on ways to look at grants and other ways to try and figure out how we're going to assess this. <coughs> um, another recommendation was to go up into the tributaries and see where things were coming from in the tributaries. So these are measurements from all over the different, different parts of the watershed. We've been refining our process over the last two years, so we have at least five samples per site. And that gives us a geometric mean, which is a really good average um, on what the levels are. But we can see that everything is still really above uh, what our basic ecological threshold is. So we've really got a lot of work to do. Um, the UMass Horse Farm had a bunch of improvements recently. The Divine Farm has had a bunch of improvements recently. So we expect to see things going in the right direction. Um, that's part of our continuing monitoring this year. Should be able to tell us some of that. Um, a lot of this is really just keeping livestock out of the streams and out of the lake. Um, some of it is having to do with storage of silage and drainage that goes directly into streams. But um, we're starting to see some improvements now with various projects and working with our local natural resources conservation service and the other planning agencies around is going to be really important for creating solutions for these, uh, these issues. So this is a picture of what our pond looks like in the summertime. Um, one of our strategies for dealing with nuisance plants and invasive plants, we deal with water chestnut a lot. 
Uh, so we've been trying to really get out there early in the spring and pick quite a bit of the water chestnut before it disappears and the rest of the algae and floating aquatic plants. And it's really hard to see what you're picking at out there. So that's been a strategy that we've had over the last few years, and we are seeing, seeing those numbers decreasing. This is a shot of the aerial view of the pond two years ago. And we can see that the beds of aquatic vegetation are really extending from the headwaters all the way into here. So this is our mid lake site right here in this last little bit that's still open. Conservancy. We um, look at this site on six sites around, including the lake, and five tributaries. And we're also seeing elevated sites as far up as Eastman Brook going into Amherst. Um, so, this again has been a really useful tool as far as telling people and the agencies where problems are and where possible conservation projects can. Volunteers. This was a water chestnut project in, uh, pulling the effort in 2015. Um, so some of these strategies have been really influencing the rest of aquatic plant management around the state. Um, using barge boats like this, accumulating a bunch of materials that are having individual paddlers paddle to the shore and dump it. Uh, we've got John boats now, which can travel easily within the shallow areas of the lake. Um, air boats are being used sporadically, and also devices that actually harvest and pull the water, pull the water just not out of the water physically. Um, so we're going to be looking at, I think, for dealing with our native plant assemblages, more of a mechanical uh, solution to this, uh, which again is going to be expensive about $1,000 an acre to, to harvest plants mechanically. So that also is going to be something we're going to be looking at in our future. And that is going to be opening up <coughs> more habitat for good fisheries. This is a large amount of bass that was caught this year on the pond. Pete Schoenberger, who wrote a nice article for us in our newsletter. So this is really what we want to do. We want to improve conditions for recreational users and people who fish and canoe on the pond. And that's our goal, and that's what we're doing as an organization. Uh, it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of cooperation. And we need everybody's help. So we appreciate you all coming. We appreciate your support over the years. And uh, we're looking forward to staying in touch. Anybody have any questions? Four questions there are, and I'd like to jump in just to summarize a couple of points that I want to make sure you got what Jason just told us. <coughs> One is that um, the growers are paying attention. So the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission was up here 15 years ago trying to convince farmers, different growers, to improve their practices so that the watershed, you know, uh, could improve itself, and it didn't work very well. The last two or three years, um, with Jason's help and uh, board members' help, we now have two, three, four major Hadley growers um, really making an effort to uh, avoid bad stuff going into the streams that run into the Mill River and then Connecticut. So that, that's a big deal. The um, strategies, Jason used the word strategies a few times. So you're, I'm going to get the numbers wrong here. Help me if you want, Jason. But four, five years ago, four years ago, we pulled almost 6,000 pounds of water chestnuts out of the pond. The following year was about 4,000, then 2,000. Now, what, so the yeah, strategy yeah, down to 800. And 800. Uh, so the strategy down to 17. So right, but when we, it doesn't come back. It comes back. You know, if you don't, if you're not on it and on it quickly, it comes back. You know, the seed life has a has a life lifespan of 12 years. Right. So we're really battling against plants that have an advantage over. You know, what we can do as as humans. So I'm sent to be from the Conti Center, the federal folks were out there pulling weeds this morning, and they found a bunch of young plants. I mean, I don't think the pile would have been this big. I don't think they got even 200 pounds of plants. I may be off. 
but she had, I think, six boats out there. And they found a few young plants, but not many. So this strategy of getting out there early and often to, to yank water chestnuts is, is really working. So the growers are helping. The water chestnut population is decreasing. Um, the airboats and other things that the Friends of Lake Water have come up with to help with harvest it is working. And um, anyway, so there's some very significant, tangible, quantifiable things that this little group of volunteers and, and Jason has made happen. So, David, let me, let me just add that it's not just the growers and the agricultural um, producers that have it either. We're having, you know, Amherst, the town of Amherst has grown from a town of 1,500 people to a town of nearly 40,000 people, you know, in the last 150 years. So municipal stormwater is really important. Um, having good planning and growth, um, growth ordinances is really important. And sort of making sure that we have smart development and that developers are being accountable for urban pollution as well. Because some of those are some of the highest levels that we have is coming out of one brook coming out of the middle of Amherst and the Goose Pond, UMass. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, just wondering if you could mention the HHCD and then our point to make also farmers aware of the grants available mm -hmm. for um, best practices and remediation. Yeah. And also the collaboration with UMass. Yeah, the Hampshire Hamden Conservation District is working closely with Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is the federal entity. Um, mm -hmm. They both have programs grant programs that can supply up to 75% of the cost of restoration programs and conservation efforts on the farms that have a conservation plan already. Now, the majority of our farms in North Hadley are already under Chapter 61A, and permanently reserved, and so they already have a conservation plan detailing work that could be done on their farm. So it's really Hadley farmers and Amherst farmers coming forth and saying, this is something that I used to recognize that's happening on my property, I'm losing some soil here, we're having erosion or runoff problems here, um, which is really going to make things happen. Um, collaboration with the university has really been key. They've been able to take on things that we haven't been able to afford to take on. So flow monitoring, the main stem of the Mill River, um, checking these phosphorus models and getting updates, using our data to update phosphorus models and predictions showing where where pollution is coming in off the landscape. Um, the sort of networking and collaboration and those having grad students and PhD level students working on projects in the lake and river is really um, an area that's been important for us and I think it's going to be important in the future. Yes? Yeah, I'm just wondering if these water testaments have any commercial potential in terms of local Chinese restaurants or local <laughs> markets. They aren't that water testament. They, aren't that. They, they, are, they are used throughout the world and they grind flour, make a flour out of the nuts and the meals, but um, that would also encourage them to try and grow to their full potential, and we don't really want to do that because it's easy for them to spread once they mature completely. So we're trying to get them young before they even set their nuts and mature. Um, I keep hoping someone with a biodiesel or a biogenerator is going to want to use some of our plants so we're not going to have to take it so far because a lot of the majority of the cost for disposing of plants and material is the cost of trucking and disposal. So if we can get somebody into an integrated network and a system who's using that to make energy or to compost, that's really going to be a success. And if you talk to the Barstow, so how can we Yeah, yeah, we have. Yes, Amy? If people want to uh, get more involved or to help the friends of Lake Corner, what are some uh, good ideas for that? To try to do? Well, we have a water chestnut poll next week. So next Saturday, we're going to be having a, a poll. And you're welcome to come out onto the pond. We have been at it pretty hard, so I don't expect that we're going to have a big harvest. So a lot of it is just more exploration and paddling than it is actually pulling. So if you want to get out on the pond and have fun, uh, please contact us. We also are interested in taking people out um, on excursions if they're interested in getting out and exploring and don't have access to a boat or don't know the pond well enough to explore. What time, Jason, next Saturday and where? 10, to, 10, to, two, or down here? 10 to 2, we meet at the boat ramp. How do people get in touch with us? Uh, we've got a web page, website, friendsoflakewarner.org, and we have, an, we have a Gmail address, friends of Lake Warner at um, gmail.com. Uh, most of you have received communications from us, which is why you're here. So 
you, know, you can always reach out to me individually or get a hold of one of the board members or contact us via the web.